we here? I have Divine Cha. He's also a cybersecurity specialist. Hi. And I have with me Winston Winston Woodshe. What's up? Did I get it right? Yeah, it's a proper noun. So <laughs> okay. So we're going to be talking privacy and data protection. So before we begin this whole conversation, there's one person that will have will have a lot of answers for us, Ms. Patricia Poku, because you are the executive director of the Data Protection Commission. And a lot of Ghanaians don't know what data protection is. They actually they don't know that their data actually needs protecting. Am I right? No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, so what is the Data Protection Commission? Okay, so the, the Data Protection Commission has been established by Act uh, of, of Parliament. And it's, it's needed because the law has been passed to protect the personal data of individuals in the country as part of their fundamental human rights. That's to address a global challenge, a global problem that the world is now facing as a result of increased uh, use of technology, the pace of digitization, and, and the, 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 the use of social media, uh, to mention a few. And so we have moved as a, as a globe from the use of manual collected data, uh, the old filing uh, cabinet that is in a room that can be locked away, to a soft electronic data and collection uh, that is done uh, at, the, at the speed of light, uh, shared across the world, to the extent where if it's not protected can impact on an individual's well-being, can be damaging to their person uh, or, or their, 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 you know, their space, their information, uh, and how they, they can uh, have a right to live in private in different fronts. Right. So uh, governments across the world have passed the Data Protection Act to protect the rights of living individuals. And, and I'll uh, emphasize on the word living because it protects people who are alive and not deceased. Great. So with all this being said, what do you actually do for us who have our data out there? So for instance, now we're telling people that, hey, there's a data protection commission who's in charge of protecting your data. Now, you told us what you guys do. But here I am. I've heard a lot of, you know, legal terminologies and business terminologies. But for the layman out there who's thinking that, okay, so I don't know even if my data is safe or not. How does the Data Commission, Protection Commission, help me? Okay, so your first question was, why do we have a commission? Well, the commission is established to... Uh, hold our entities accountable for the way they collect and process their personal data. Mm. So the Data Protection Commission is the organization or the entity that the government has uh, given that mandate to to structure the way uh, and to set the criteria to which data can be collected and and to give some sort of controls, legal mandates, or legitimate, to assess the legitimate grounds on which data can be collected and processed and, and, and also to enable entities across the nation, which could be individuals as well mm. or organizations, to be accountable for the how they collected, when they collected, who they give access to, uh, and, and be, to be able to demonstrate it with uh, documentary evidence uh, on request right. so that individuals can, based on that, exercise their rights. Okay. So, Ash, yes, you're sir. an ethical hacker. You're a uh, cybersecurity specialist, right? That's correct, yeah. So which one do you prefer, ethical hacker or cybersecurity specialist? I would <laughs> prefer the latter, to be honest. Okay. I'm kind of past that stage, which I would call myself ethical hacker. Okay. So are we protected in this country? Is um, our data safe? It's not just, to be honest, Ghana. I mean, I worked prior to here, I worked in the UK, like uh, Madame Poker herself. Um, I mean, protection and security is never 100%. Mm. Um, what we... Uh, seem to be lacking at least from my uh, sort of understanding here in Ghana for the past sort of two three years I've been here is that um, there's not much attention being paid by the public themselves to sort of personal data and perhaps one of the reasons is that there is a bit of a lack of awareness um, so therefore there's no mandate from the organizations or companies as such to hold that data 
securely, of course, they can go ahead and register with Data Protection Commission and they can, you know, have compliance, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we all fully know that, you know, compliance and certifications, all that kind of stuff doesn't exactly mean real security. Um, and we've seen this case globally. Um, so the big hacks like, you know, Target and PayPal and, for example, recently the, the Singapore uh, sort of the health system has been attacked and they had some, um, you know, millions of uh, sort of patient data that got stolen all over the place. Uh, I'm sure all of these companies were registered with the local um, data protection commissions. They all had some sort of, you know, PCI DSS, all sort of fancy certifications. PCI DSS is? PCI DSS basically is a certification which applies to banks. So it's a, a payment card industry uh, data security standard. Um, so it would kind of mandate the bank and regulate them in a sense whereby they hold uh, card information, account data, credit card data, all that kind of stuff in a secure manner in a way, ba in a way that an unauthorized entity cannot access it easily. Okay. Uh, so this certification actually kind of does regulate the industry a little bit and each industry have their own sort of certifications. For, for example, this PCI is for the banks. There's another one called HIPAA for the, the health organizations. We don't have it here in, in Ghana. And there's all these different ones. Uh, but again, one has to be very careful not to hide behind these certifications and actually be conscious about uh, protecting the the data of the public. Um, we have actually have seen examples here in Ghana that the companies, big companies, these are as well, big entities. You know, and all you pick in the industry, I can tell you uh, that they are vulnerable. That they are storing, you know, a huge amount of data on the servers. Um, you know, these are things like first names, surnames, addresses, date of birth, uh, things that you know they don't change. You know, you don't go and change your name. You don't go mm -hmm. change your date of birth. So these are. Uh, really key data, as well as the passwords, all that kind of stuff. And they're not necessarily in encrypted. They're not necessarily using the best uh, sort of security best practices. And it's fairly easy to retrieve it. As a matter of fact, Divine here, my colleague, we just had a conversation not too long ago that he oh. came across loads of uh, what they called uh, credential dumps. These are uh, sort of uh, sort of password files or email files you can find, not necessarily even on the dark web that you can download for, you know, $5, $10, and you basically have, you know, the key to the kingdom. You have, you know, I can basically go and find your Facebook mm. account details um, on one of these dumps, if, of course, that Facebook has been breached into. And these Divide. cases have happened before. You want to tell us about this dump that you found? Okay, so uh, mostly when hackers compromise systems, mm -hmm. mostly they don't use the information themselves. Right. So they provide it to other hackers to, to they, at a fee, no, it's usually not free, to okay. make use of these credentials. So let's say, you can go on the dark web, but they also cleared net sites where you can just go in, create an account, and download these files. So, for example, if an attacker, instead of using your tools and your skills to compromise the system, you can just download a dump. If, let's say, Facebook has been compromised, you can search uh, for an organization and then yeah, use the domain and then the emails uh, associated with the domain to log into the systems instead of going through the whole hacking technology or right. methodology. So, any layman. Like Winston and I, are we yeah. laymen? Mm. I guess. <laughs> we can just go on the internet and look for, say, we're looking for a bank that's been attacked. Yes. And then the uh, usernames and passwords have been uploaded there. Incredible. And then just go and grab them for a fee. Yes. And then come and try and I get in. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this happening like this, Miss Foku, so let's say this happens and then we find out that like a bank has been compromised and our data has been released. What kind of sanctions do you, you know, have in place to take care of these situations, these so banks? So we'll take you a step, slight, a, mm. a step back. So right. it's not, let's say, mm. it is actually happening on every day, everywhere. Right. It's a mess globally. It's not a Ghana thing. It's a global problem. Mm. So it's already happening. What are we doing as a commission? We've realized, uh, and this is regulators globally coming together, have realized that it's not, it's not so much like uh, Ash was saying, it's not mm. so much about sanctioning strictly and, and you know, demonstrating with paper compliance, checkbox yeah. action, etc. We're now seeing that it's, it's three pronged. So we're looking at the technologies that are being used, the people and the processes. And for a decade or so, we've been so focused on technology and advancing technology and use of technology that somehow it looks like the people and the process aspect of it has been kind of left aside. So our current focus as regulators globally are now focusing uh, so much on uh, encouraging that change of mindset 
empowering individual to own their the the process their their contribution mm. to this uh, digitized effort and and their interaction with technology to ensure that they are understanding their rights and the not just their rights that the that the implications of their actions mm. online and on with with the use of technology so there are individuals like you and I out there then there are employees of big uh, data controllers such as the health sector, public sector, big high volume channels mm -hmm. of personal data. Their employees should be trained. The, the, the more trained employees that we can have or the more savvy uh, individuals on the street, mm. the more likely we are as, as, a, as a world to, to be more conscious of how we, we contribute to this mess and right. to, to reduce the mess. And so we are in for you know, raising awareness, campaigning, uh, and getting people understanding uh, how to interact with technology because you can have the best of technology, but the people will let the systems down. Yeah. And so that's the way we're looking at it. And then en encouraging key decision makers, CEOs, owners of organizations to make the right decisions around how they process personal data. So that is holding them accountable and ac getting them acting responsibly. Right. So I can see on Ash's laptop, security is not complete without you. So it's like security spelled out with a U missing. Mm -hmm. So that basically summarizes everything that yes. you just said. Yes. <laughs> okay, so joining us on the phone lines is Mr. Carl Saki. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Carl. Hello. Hello. Hello, hi. Mr. Saki. Hi. Good evening. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Yeah. So if you've been following the conversation, we're talking about privacy and data safety. Yes, I have. Yes, data protection. The, uh, yes, I have. Great. So we were we were talking right now, and then Divine was mentioning that some you know some banks have had their credentials dumped online, and people grab them. I mean, it's it's scary to know that you have your information online, and it can be easily accessed. So, Ms. Poku was also mentioning how we need to empower people, we need to educate people, both the employees and the users of these systems, on how to basically take advantage of the security, securities available to them. Yes, that's but, correct. Yes, if you can, I mean, knowing Ghana, we have this problem where even IT as a whole is scary for most. People consider it as a, something that it's, it's alien. How do we begin? How do we begin to empower everyone from the market woman to the university graduate? All right. Um, well, I, I think that, yes, uh, we have in Canada that uh, technology is alien. But then if you look at technology carefully, you notice that gradually there's, uh, there's pervasive use of technology everywhere. Now, uh, how do we bridge this particular gap? particularly when it comes to the security, privacy of information. It starts with, I think that the most important thing is um, awareness. So we need to do a lot more training. We need to do a lot more awareness campaigns. We need to do a lot more sensitization. And I think that this can be broken down into the different uh, levels. So you those for, say, expert users or people who are, who are proficient in the use of technology, all the way down to the person in the street who does not really understand or just knows how to use technology, but does not see the importance of uh, private information. Okay, so here's one thing that we need to know. As a people, generally, we are very trusting. Now, I think that uh, if culturally we're brought up to be trusting, uh, so we're brought up to divulge information. Uh, we're brought up not to be able to, we don't really care so much about private information, so it's not a big deal because we've never seen the importance of that. But in this particular era in which we are now, things are changing, where the minute somebody has your private information, I think that personally identifiable information, the person has you, let me put it in that perspective. And so I know your date of birth, I know your passport number, your driving license details, I know a few more details about you, and I can get access to your bank account information. So we need to start changing that particular conversation. And so I, I was listening to Patricia saying it, uh, and, and I think I also listened to Ash when he mentioned that 
it is not so much a focus on the technology, but on changing the way people do things, changing how we relate to security, how we, it, it should be part of our fabric. Uh, we need to actually sensitize people. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of work that is being done, uh, but it's, it's supposed to be a conversation that's not done just by the practitioners, but even as institutions like yours. And that's, I, I think that I like this conversation that we're having this evening, and it should be a sustained effort. Great. Thank you very much. Um, You're so, welcome. Um, but please stay on the line. We will definitely come back to you. Um, sure. Winston, yeah. you, you are like me. We use technology. Have you educated anyone lately? On data privacy and protection? Yes. Oh, yeah. Recently. Because uh, when I came, Ash, they were talking about Pond.com, I believe. Yes, yeah. Pond. Yeah. And I remember a couple of months back, I was, I think... This is something people should take seriously. Mm. When you have an email account, you should at least check it twice a day when you wake up and before you sleep. So I checked my email and I wasn't able to access it. And then Google tells me someone tried to breach into my email. I should check it up. I should change my password and everything. It didn't allow me any access. So I had to go through the entire process. Then I found out about the pawn.com. And when I checked, it tells me that I had been breached twice. Interesting. Yeah, so you can actually go on that site and it will give you a lot. I feel so like pwned as in P-W-N-E-D dot com. Yeah, it's P-W-N-E-D. Actually, have I been pwned? Have I been, have I been pwned? pwned? It's, it's a free com. service, uh, which is run by this uh, really cool guy called Troy Hunt. Yeah. And he's a researcher in the field himself. So basically, the idea was he came across so many of these uh, password dumps uh, that mm. Divine mentioned earlier on. So he goes around, actually goes the extra length of validating to see if actually are true. If they are, you can actually subscribe to this for free of charge and it will notify you. Say, hey, you know, the Dropbox you're using or the Facebook or the LinkedIn, they've just been hacked. Go change your password all over the place if you're using the same password. Right. So if you're listening, it's haveibeenpwned.com. So have, H-I-A-V-E-I as in I, and then P-W-N-E-D dot com. That's good. And then you can check to see if you have been pwned or <laughs> hacked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Much. So why, how come this is not in the open domain? Like, Everyone should know about this. Everyone should be checking this as regularly as possible. I mean, Divine, you and Ash are cybersecurity specialists. You guys do this all the time. How Do you always come across people who know about this service, for instance? Uh, not necessarily. I guess it's also the awareness side of it. People are, tend to be quite ignorant when it comes to security. You know, we, I've seen people happily, you know, downloading all sort of applications on a phone and giving all sort of permissions to this application. You know, share my contact, share my location. Yeah, why not, you know? I want to, you know, play a game. You know, just click next, next, next. Or you give it to your kid and they are just, you know, doing whatever they want to do on your mm. phone. So I guess it's that sort of stuff. It, of course, it's a bit of an awareness. And also you being a bit paranoid. You picked on my laptop. I can see on your laptop you say, do not trust, trust anyone. anyone. exactly. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of true as well. Uh, so you have to, I guess you have to respect your own personal data. Mm. Uh, so others will do too. Uh, so, yeah, the likes of DataBath and your location. I mean, we, do, we, we put a lot of uh, sort of weight on our phones these days. We do everything with our phones. Yeah. You know, our social media, our banking, our text message, our mobile money, the whole lot. So I think people have to just be conscious about these things. And yes, not everyone is on the same page. You know, we know about it perhaps because we're constantly researching these things online. We're looking around ourselves and we come across all these cool names on, you know, all these, uh, you know, Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And we follow them and we see what latest work they're doing. But, of course, not everyone has that sort of uh, uh, sort of appetite for this yeah. kind of stuff. So I think the thing is, Internet has a wealth of information. If you really are lost and you don't know what to do or how to protect yourself, it's all it takes is just to Google and just say, <laughs> how can I do this? How can I do that? And there's so much YouTube videos and so many articles online. It's just You need to have the interest in the first place mm -hmm. in order to find that information. So if we you need to spark that interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, the reality of the stuff is like all those dumps that uh, Divine mentioned early on. I mean, we think, oh, this is a far-fetched thing. There's some guy in the U.S. or some guy in the U.S. Mm -hmm. No, the data we came across are people in Ghana. I mean, if Winston sitting here who is tech yes. savvy found his data and he's a tech savvy there. and he's a guy who's careful and he's probably a guy I'm hoping that he's not <laughs> using the same password all over the place <laughs> that's another thing as well that mm. people share the same password all over different accounts or they use one single account to signing up to that sort of magazine which yeah. sends you one update every now and then and do you use the same account to do your critical online banking you know that's but also something which should be done I've realized that the older generation have a problem remembering numerous passwords yes so imagine my mother, yeah. a retiree, 
Sitting at home, she can only bother herself with one password. And you're asking her, okay, you need a, a password for your Facebook, for your Instagram. That's <laughs> assuming she's on all these platforms. She's tell you, you know what, just add one <laughs> to, to, to it, you know, to That's differentiate true. it. But they want to go ahead. I'll okay, talk um, the thing is that there are password management applications like, mm. that, like LastPass. And yeah. One password. password. One password, <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So if uh, you find it difficult to, like, uh, remember different passwords, you mm-hmm. can use the manager. It will, it, will, it will like generate passwords for you very complex passwords mm. like when you mention the password we use I think it's people use very weak passwords they'll use their date of birth they'll use their daughter's name password so, one. A, so an attacker can easily social engineer the password out to you and also they can brute force the password with the a dictionary list mm. the, the hacker has a list of possible password list you feed it to uh, your website or wherever and it will keep sort of hitting 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 until it gets the right one it gets the right one so you should stop using weak passwords right yeah okay so here's the thing someone's finding asking why 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 would a hacker even steal data for you know what do they need with that data what do you need my name and my my password you know have it it. that's what someone says like (laughs) have it you know let them have it after all i have nothing in my bank account okay i guess it depends on who you are if you have something to lose Mm. you would be very careful because someone like me Okay, I'm very careful regardless of whether I have anything in my bank account mm. or otherwise. But, okay, this is a funny story I was told recently by a friend who works in IT where one of his colleagues came to him where he he had been breached and the person who had breached him or hacked into his uh, was asking for 8,000 bitcoins or something mm. wow. to pay back. <laughs> I don't think there's 8,000 bitcoins. Yeah. <laughs> 8,000 dollars in bitcoin. No, it was 8,000 dollars <laughs> worth of bitcoin. bitcoin. Yeah. yeah, sorry. And the thing was... She, he said he had gotten access to her email and seen all her oh, yeah. entire uh, <laughs> contact list. And he had he had videos of her doing some things. Yeah. So <laughs> if she didn't pay up, she, she, she was, was just going to broadcast it. Yeah. everything. And yeah, I mean, no matter what you do, where we are right now, you will leave a data print, a virtual mm. print somewhere. Unless you are using a YAM or you are entirely off the grid. No matter what you do, you're going to leave a print. I think people just need to understand this, that it's very difficult to not give away data, but you should be careful who, who you're giving, you're it giving to. your data to. So would you be comfortable giving your data to Ash and Divine? <laughs> I mean, giving up data is about trust. Uh-huh. So if I trust them, definitely. Well, did you see why I wrote that? <laughs> trust no one. <laughs> well, can, I, can I add quickly sure. on the value of data mm. out there? Uh, it's now been assessed as the new gold, exactly the new fuel, uh, like how we value oil yeah. on the on the external uh, international markets or gold. Uh, this is the value you place on. That's the good side of it. The bad side of it is the is how how dreadful will it be if, for example, your identity is stolen and used for something bad like a crime. Mm, exactly. The, the yeah. time you can't cost the time. Or to like affect an election. That, that, <laughs> yes, or exactly. to affect an election, mm-hmm. yeah. or, or oh. to make a decision that you would have made differently yeah. on your behalf. How far would they go to do things like that? If they're going to use your identity to, say, rob a bank or commit some crime, that would mean an prison sentence for you. The, the time that you would use to justify or to find an alibi for the police to uh, go to the lens of, you know, trying to defend yourself, you mm-hmm. can't cost yeah. this, this kind of damage. And it's the reason why you would want to protect your uh, personal data data from unauthorized access, access right. because y- someone it, you, there could be several you out there doing stuff that you don't even I know, know right and that yeah. is a worry yeah it could be used to reach out to your family to cause a whole lot of damage yeah if you're a parent it could be used to uh maybe radical uh, radicalize your mm. uh, teenage uh Children. child mm. or whatever so many uh hard hitting or impact on mm. your personal life and livelihood uh, that can happen because you've let your data out there. Yeah. And so it's not so much the financial uh, extortion mm-hmm. that can yeah. happen, but the, the, the direct impact on your, all that. on your well-being well, yeah. and your livelihood that, that you, you can't even act quantify, quantify in yeah. terms. Mr. Carl, do you have anything to add to that? Well, uh, I, I think that uh, the point I want to make is that um, so far, many people have actually not realized the value of data personally personally identifiable information. Um, it is priceless. 
And I think that uh, if you look at the example Patricia made about somebody using your identity to perpetrate a crime, there's exactly impossible. I mean, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to extricate yourself from crime because, you know, the person basically is living in the shadows and is using your identity. But looking beyond that, there's also the element of, say, the financial aspect to it, where, uh, I mean, the loss to you could be repairable, you could be out of a job, uh, and so many things. And then at the organization level, the reputation that the organization will suffer if they are breached and customers' personal uh, information goes out. And so here in Ghana, we're talking about the one Ghana card, the Ghana card, for instance, uh, which I, the, at the end of the day is supposed to be able to help you transact businesses across practically every sector. It's going to be used everywhere. This conversation becomes actually even more imperative because that card contains everything about you, your biometric details, your data, everything. And so we need to be able to sensitize the populace as to how to protect, how not to just divulge the information, and how to also, even from this, make sure that all institutions that access information on this card are actually well protected. And so it's not just the technology side, but even the education side as well. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's something that we cannot do without. We definitely have to make sure that we have that conversation and then we have serious audit. Uh, so you have the professionals, Ash and uh, the, the ethical hackers, uh, institutions that there where they can do this test and we we'll still have a conversation as to how to protect this information. Great. That's something that I want to add. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Carl Saki, for a contribution. You're welcome. Right. Okay. So, Thank you very much. No. right. Um, another thing that came to my mind when I was doing some research on this was, I mean, I read, when Facebook, you realize Facebook lost some money last week. Half a million pounds, some money. <laughs> that's too much money to think about, you know, that's I don't like to. <laughs> <laughs> For I mean, them, it's nothing probably, it's pocket yeah. money, you know. It's a weekend dinner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then while researching this, I find that every user of, like, every internet user actually has a value to them. So, like, Facebook users in America are actually valued at about $25 per head. And Facebook users in Africa and Ghana, about $2 per head. Depends who are the buyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this kind of information brought to bear that. So it means that people actually have value online. And they're not realizing how much value they, are, they have. Considering, let's say, when advertisers are using you to your browsing habits to target what kind of ads they show to you. And then at the end of the day, you're giving your data free. So now we're telling people not to give away their data. Isn't this going to affect advertisers? Say I decided, okay, I'm going to go safe. I'm browsing anonymously. Now I cannot be tracked, nothing. Who is suffering then? Isn't it the advertisers are suffering? Isn't it going to create like a visual a visual cycle that eventually comes to affect us, the users too? Um, I think, yes, of course it would affect them. Because um, mm. we talked about digital fingerprint early on. Yeah. So you have the a, a sort of a profile from each person. Your habits, uh, what you wear, what you do. Uh, you talk about research. Actually, I did a bit of research on yourself before I got here. And you share a lot on your social media. Yeah. And you're rightly so. And you're very active. So, for example, I know you like your BMWs. And <laughs> you have a Samsung S8 Plus, which you take a lot of photos of it. And you do your music production with FO Studio, usually mm -hmm. on Sundays. You see, so, if I can get that data, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all these guys can also get mm. it. And they can start monetizing. If they, yeah. for example, they know you're doing some music production, next thing you know, they start advertising headphones next to your, to your post. And try to, you know, I mean, yet I think Google announced it. Uh, one of the biggest revenue ge generations this took is the AdWords, is mm. the stuff, the advertisement from Google. Of course, if you start to anonymize your uh, sort of browsing on the internet and, you know, do all this, do not track me, all that kind of stuff, of course, it's going to have a reverse of effect on them. And they're trying their very best to stop people doing that, mm. by the way. You know, they're trying with all these features and say, oh, come, you know, let me give you the power to delete all your data, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But you really know that there is still some sort of, some form of uh, tracking involved mm. in there. But as an individual, again, it's just down to yourself. How paranoid are you? You know, some people don't mind it. Like, actually, I know I like it that I see some advertisement on the site because mm. I like to see these things and that would actually lead me to buy some exactly. interesting things. But some people are very conscious of their habits, all that kind of stuff, and they think there's a big brother watching, all that kind of stuff. So 
these are the guys like myself that we do, if it comes to a sensitive thing, I actually don't use you know these uh, conventional browsers and stuff like that. Or even I use a, br a brand new machine and I do my stuff, then I mm. just that's it and I, I get rid of it. Um, so yeah, I mean. People do share a lot of stuff online, or even your search habits. Like you know, all yeah. of, most of the people who have Android phone. You must have a Google account. Definitely. If you have a Google account, that means whatever you search on your Android phone, Google has kept a history of that. As a matter of fact, you can go to Google and see your entire search histories, the YouTube videos you you watched, watch. the, the places you checked into, all those comments you left for all these different places you've been to, all these places you created, all that kind of stuff. So there's a huge metadata. Basically, there's a huge fingerprint on each individual, and that's definitely worth a lot of value because they can easily sell that. Mm. Because now, even here in Africa, they can go in Ghana, even they can go say, Hey, for example, you are a telco, you want to target an audience of 18 to 25, which are the male or female, and they just graduated from certain university, so they will buy your product. Here, I have like four million people you can advertise to them. Yeah. Now, you're gonna pay me, I don't know, uh, five cents per, per, per user. So, it's, it's all end of day, it's all money, it's all <laughs> money. So, we have to be very conscious about. How much data we are we are we are sharing online, and and I think it's super super important. Mm. So divine, yeah. say I want to go anonymous yeah. on the internet. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do? Okay, so uh, the basic the basic very basic one is to go incognito mode. So like most of the browsers have these privacy modes where you select it and then you can browse anonymously. But if you want to go further, they have like the tour. Browser, browser yeah and the brave browser yes and but that and that. i actually found out that even in incognito mode they yeah. can still track okay so incognito mode is only your, your browser history is not yeah being logged, it's not being logged yeah internet activity your isp actually knows which mm. pages you are going to which videos you are watching but the browser or maybe like google won't have that information in quotes yeah, yeah. saying in quotes <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening yeah. to us geek squad is brought to you by safe doctor the app that gives you a doctor in your pocket. So download the Safe Doctor app now from the Google Play Store. Safe Doctor, the future of better medical care. So, you know, historically, technology has always outpaced regulation. But then again, regulation pulls tech backwards. Then they will say, okay, you know what, let's come back. Let's come back. Let's come back. Let's look. Re let's relook at things and then move on. Now, the problem is that the policy makers are not as sophisticated as, you know, most of the time, the technology that comes out. I'll give you an example. When Mark Zuckerberg went before Congress, I some know. of the questions that were asked, really, I was cringing. I mean, you know, these are the people supposed to keep these people in check and they didn't know what they were talking about. How do we guarantee that the people who are going to safeguard us actually know what this is about. I'm sure half the people in Congress over there have their data all over, their passwords had already been hacked and all that. How can we make sure that these people are up to the task? We need to educate them. Even the people who are supposed to come and educate us. <laughs> we need to. Because lawmakers are mm. also doing a job. Yeah. They are trained to make laws. They're not technocrats or what, what the So why don't we hire technocrats so, who can make the laws? So then that, that would mean that every law would need a core expertise. Mm. To, so we'll need a group of uh, parliamentary experts for each, each legal area, which wouldn't work, which is not practical. <laughs> and so it's about getting the people who make the laws generate to, to get m multiple knowledge areas through research involving. So I, I see this as a collaborative effort. Right. The traditional way of doing things is out of the window now. It's not just about the lawmaking, even cooking, even eating, going out has changed. Mm. Everything has, and the world must, uh, people, policy makers, business people, key decision makers must move abreast with the, the pace of technology now. So it's not just about uh, those who make the law. Yeah, you're right. They should understand before they make a law, they should understand what the, 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 the landscape of that legal area is mm. and what is happening. But the nature of technology and the pace and the change of the technological landscape is so fast mm -hmm. that legal and lawmakers cannot keep up. So are regulators. So we get the act. We are looking at the act now, putting it into business speak to bridge the gap between the actual act and business as usual. But during the time, like all this time that for example, I'll put myself in the in the, the space now. I've got the, the responsibility now to lead the commission to convert this act into business speak, into layman's understanding, so we can raise awareness with the public and 
uh, get the business understanding what this really means to their business as usual. All this time, technology is advancing. Digitization is happening. Look at Ghana as a key case study. Whilst we are trying to convert the act into guidance and uh, delivery of training and, and raising awareness in the country, the pace of digitization hasn't stopped. We're getting e-Ghana, e-government, e-finance, e-everything you can think about. And even in Africa, it's worse because where Europe has taken 25 years to get to, we want to do in a year or, or 18 months, we want to do it. Mm. The pace of technology is even faster than that. Yeah. It's like at the speed of light. Yeah. So how do we catch up with the changes by the time we've developed one guidance note that goes through parliament for <laughs> approval, that goes through mm. board of directors that meet quarterly, technology has changed. Mm -hmm. We're telling people, be savvy, uh, read Google, do this. And, and now this, have I been pawned <laughs> or something else had come up. And so we can never be concise with what we are, what we are delivering mm. to the public. So it's on the individual as well and other entities, other uh, experts like cybersecurity experts to be in a collaborative front with lawmakers, with regulators, and, and we need to work together like we are now to, to uh, have a semblance of uh, a parallel with the pace of change because we can never catch up. And that's the way the world is. It's what it is. Brilliant, brilliant. You're right on time for me to go on a break. <laughs> so, um, Safe Doctor again, which is actually my favorite app. I don't like going to the hospital. I'm sure you guys don't too. <laughs> Although it's a, bad, it's a bad habit, but Safe Doctor has come to save me. It's a telemedicine app that allows you to consult with a doctor of your choice anytime, anywhere, and any place you're using your smartphone. Safe Doctor brings together doctors, hospitals, pharmacies, laboratories, and other healthcare service providers all on your phone. You can have real-time video consultation with a qualified doctor and receive lab requests and prescriptions to partner labs and pharmacies. This provides convenience, saving in time, cost, and makes you the center of care. Safe, Safe Doctor app also gives you access to a well-researched library of current medical issues, offers tips on first aid and access to our medical chat room. Your medical records are also available on your phone in the event of an emergency. Reach Safe Doctor on 0302-909-746, 055-832-4704. I'll repeat it, 0302-909-746 or 055-832-4704. Or visit www.softedgelimited.com softedgelimited.com Facebook handle is safe doctor GH the doctor is a K not a C for more details download the safe doctor app now from the Google Play Store and take control of your health safe doctor the future of better medical care if you are if you are well, you know the same person shivering so much this morning from a fever. Which hospital did you go to? Oh, Kweku, I just went to the hospital on my phone. It's called Safe Doctor. And which hospital too is that? Safe Doctor is an all-new telemedicine app which allows me to access world-class Medicare right from my mobile phone. The app lets me have real-time video consultation with very qualified doctors of my choice wherever I am. Oh, wow. But what about when you need to run labs and take a prescription? Safe Doctor has partnered hospitals, labs, and pharmacies. I just received the request for the lab or prescription from Safe Doctor, and I simply go to the lab or pharmacy for them. I even have access to first aid, other health information, and an elite medical chat room. Wow, I must get this app. Download the Safe Doctor app from the Google Play Store. Safe Doctor, the future of better medical care. For funerals. For weddings, for birthdays, or for when you just want to party. Whatever the occasion, we'll deliver the refreshment. Take the stress out of the event planning with MySmartCoke.com. Just visit MySmartCoke.com online on your computer or smartphone and choose a package. Pay with mobile money, Visa or MasterCard, and your drinks will be delivered to your preferred location. Try it today at MySmartCoke.com or download the app from the Google Play Store. MySmartCoke. Global orders. Local deliveries.
So welcome back. You're listening to Geek Squad on Joy 99.7 FM. My name is Kobe Spikey Nkrumah, and today we're talking about data protection and privacy. So Geek Squad is brought to you by Safe Doctor, Doctor with a K. Download Safe Doctor app now from the Google Play Store. Safe Doctor, the future of better medical care. So we were talking about regulation before we went on the break. And on that note, I'd like us to talk about GDPR. I mean, the EU took a bold step introducing GDPR. And for those who don't know what GDPR is, General Data Protection Regulation. What's the, what's the alternative in Ghana? So the, it's actually the EU GDPR. The EU the GDPR. European Union General Data Protection Regulation, which is the bringing together of, of all the different regulations that mm. used to exist across Europe and merging it into one. And the Ghanaian equivalent is the Ghana Data Protection Act, Act. 2012 otherwise known as the Act 843. Okay, so on that note, good evening, guys. It's a message. Can I sue for damages the loss of data from a phone repairer? <laughs> so the process to doing that is first to complain to the phone repairer if you think they have lost data of your phone, and which should be, in order to be of interest to the commission, should be your personal data. data. So, so when Ghanaians like to say data, data generically, but we have all sorts of data. It could actually be the data, data bundle. The data protection commission is concerned <laughs> with your personal data. Data, not your data bundle. Not your generic <laughs> data or your, your broadband data mm. or your business critical data. We are personal data interested in your personal, protecting your personal data, right. which is information that uniquely identifies you. So if you find that your phone repairer has lost that information, then first, your first point of co uh, contact is the phone repairer himself, mm. is to complain to the repairer. What agreement did you have with the uh, repairer as to what he could do with that data on your phone? Mm. Did he assure you of how he would secure it? Uh, what transparent information were you given? What were you told about the how the information would be used? Yeah. And if that was lost or uh, un uh, wrongfully shared or disclosed or lost, you could then complain to that phone repairer. If they don't satisfy your uh, your inquiry, you could escalate it to the commission. Commission, right. We would then look at what the law says they can and cannot do with your your data. We check if they're registered, if they're being accountable, if they can demonstrate their accountability or show that they are uh, complying with their obligations under the, ra the act. Mm. After we make a decision at the commission, that there, yes, we agree with you, uh, the individual uh, in data protection terms called the data subject. Mm -hmm. If you, the data subject, uh, has information from the commission saying we agree with you that the repairer has breached the law, then that's your ticket to go to, to court. To go to court. That's so, a lot of work. Yes. So, <laughs> so we have to be able to get to the point mm. where the commission agrees with you that the repairer has actually breached the act. And that's on that basis, you can ask for, uh, you don't actually have to go to court. You mm. can ask them for compensation or to, 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 to uh, address the damages. If they don't, then that's your dispute with them, which can then be uh, resolved in right. court. Okay. So if you want to send us a WhatsApp, the number is 0244-340-437. I repeat, 0244-340-437. There's another message from Michael Abuchi from Sugakope. He's a student of cybersecurity. His advice to people who can't keep their passwords is that your password should be a statement or a sentence. You should have a favorite statement that you love. It can be song lyrics. I hope I make sense. Good program, Joy FM. Thanks, Michael Abuchi. Wow. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, Michael Abuchi's advice is very bad advice. Because mm. uh, I mentioned earlier, like, attackers use, uh, what do you call it? Dictionary Dictionaries. Attacks, yeah. They brute force words. Mm. Uh, NIST, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology, has guidelines for passwords. Yeah. So, you can you can look at it and it will give you, you must use alphanumeric characters, you must use a mix symbols. Of symbols. And, yeah. And uh, it has a specific character length. Mm. So, I think this statement was sent. He was to hoping it. to get like about 60 characters <laughs> in a password. <laughs> Some places have restrictions. They wouldn't allow you to go even certain numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, Michael, the experts say, unfortunately, your advice is not good enough. Not this time. Yeah. Not this time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a couple of years ago yeah. it would have helped, but now 
the computers have gotten smarter and more powerful. So, yes, back to talking about regulation. So, what does it mean for consumers and citizens when it comes to, like, data protection acts? And, like, we were talking about when it came to the advertisers, we like to see ads sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes we like to see ads. But then when all these data protection acts come into place and then they start to create a border around the advertisers where they can't go beyond a certain limit, doesn't it affect all of us? Okay, so I would like to bring it really low mm. to our attempts. It's like being in your house yeah. and someone just busting in and putting a camera in your room mm. and uh, then... Uh, selling tickets outside your door to say I've got all the information on on uh, Kobe. I know what he likes to do. I know how he buys. Um, give me so much money. Uh, Kobe will have no share of the money, but I'll be here <laughs> constantly and I'll take money for whenever I give you information mm. on Kobe. I'm sure you won't like that at all. And even if you wanted that to happen, you would want to participate in that in making money, making. <laughs> <laughs> in, in making that money. Yeah. And you'd want some sort of control mm. on the hours they can spend in your house and what they can share and what they can't share. And when they're about to give the uh, a wrong uh, profile of mm-hmm. you, you want to be able to stop them yeah. and say no, not this way, but that way. Yeah. Not on Wednesdays, but on Thursdays. So it's about you being in control of the information that concerns you, mm-hmm. that identifies you, and being able to put the blocks in when you feel like. Mm. So the act is there to empower you and I so that we can participate in, in the decision-making around the information that we give to uh, uh, entities, mm. public sector bodies, hospitals, other individuals that hold high volumes of sensitive data. So it's not always an organization. It could be, for example, a dentist or a psychologist, a small business that holds highly informa- highly sensitive information in, in, in large volumes mm. about you. You want to be able to control. Uh, if you've been in prison before, you want to serve your sentence, and after the sentence has been served, you want that to go. Yeah. You don't want you to be constantly reminded of the bad things you did when you were a teenager, when you were 10, 12 years old and went careful on Facebook. After some time, when you're married, when you got your good job, you want that to go. And that is the power that you, we want to put back. Mm. That has been, technology has taken that power from us in the way that information is being processed. And the act is there to put the power back into in our, hands. our hands so that we can be part of that decision making or we can put some objection and in block place. it and enforce it and make it stick. Is as simple as that. So the commission, on behalf of you and I, makes sure that people who collect information from us understand these rights that you have and are making positive efforts to respect your rights. Mm. So I will use the same example that you gave about advertisements. And Ash made a point that some people like it. They actually want to be shown what possible things to buy. Sometimes I like it when Amazon tells me what others have bought and and, and others who bought this also bought that. Sometimes it's nice. Other times it's it's annoying when I've looked at something, I've bought it already, and then three days later I go back and different samples of it are flashing all over the page. I'm like, no, I've bought this already. I don't want to see. So I want to be able to control how much advertisement I see on my page. The law allows you to object to, uh, it's called automated profiling. How the likes of Google and other powerful entities are able to profile you, Mm. use your uh, online behavior to make decisions about who you are or what you like. If they get it wrong and they think because you search for for a kennel that you like dogs, (laughs) they start showing you photos of dogs all over, you want to be able to write to them and say, stop. Okay. Stop, you're getting on my nerves. Right. There's actually and that a technology is the right that we put in mm, the hand of the user. There's a technology the called Silver Push. I'm sure you guys have heard about it. That it's found in some of these apps and it listens ambiently. So it doesn't monitor your search. It doesn't, you know, your browsing habits. This actually uses the microphone in your smartphone to listen to the ambience, like maybe your TV or the radio to detect what you're doing. And then it creates a profile based on what you are listening or watching. This, I find spooky. That, you know. So, you guys are the cybersecurity guys. You would know 
how to protect yourselves from some of these things. Okay, uh, what I would say is we should regularly review our privacy uh, uh, settings on our social media accounts or on our phones and then opt out of things that we aren't too sure about. Just hold on to that thought. We have a caller on the line. Hello, caller. Yeah, how are you? I'm very well. Yes. Um, <coughs> uh, let, let's not even go the Google way. I mean, in Ghana here, there are so many, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, data protection breaches here and there. For instance, uh, on a daily basis, you don't know where they got your number from. You receive all manner of text messages. So how are we protected? And the lady in your studio, definitely I shouldn't make a report because she herself, definitely, she would have also received such messages. So my question is very simple. What action is she taking against those people? Because uh, in Ghana, they will say, oh, come and report it to me. But yourself, I mean, you're supposed to also go to some of these things, not as always reporting. You have to uh, uh, send your own surveillance. So uh, and how are they uh, protecting us? Because they will also be receiving messages. That's my, my first question. My second question is that how come I, who is um, a data handler, after paying my taxes and all that, I will still have to register with the data protection agency. Can they just profile those organizations by just going to the RG department so that we can be protected? Because as it stands now, they have to come and register and pay uh, money, which most of them are not doing. So how are they able to profile all those people who are data handlers? I have a lot of questions, but I don't think you have enough time. Maybe you have to bring them back next time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I, d I couldn't get your name. Um, so, yeah, he has lots of questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> so his first question on mm. how are we handling uh, unsolicited mail and yeah. calls. Uh, we have some complaints about those. And those who have been able to tell us the source of these complaints, mm. we have contacted the... Um, agencies responsible. The data controllers in mm. data protection terms, which is the company that is mail shorting you or calling you to stop. You can ask them to stop if you can if they tell you how like some text messages will show you mm. how to stop it. You can do that. If not, we work with the telecom companies such as NCA and other telecom uh, to track uh, the, if we we know the number to to try and stop them or or, or, or do a spot check on mm. them, assess their compliance status, how they get gathering this information, and then. Uh, uh, doing the enforcement action as necessary that way. But it's hard, like he's saying, to track all of them and know who is doing it. But when it comes to our notice, we will deal with it. We don't let this go. So it's on individuals to actually complain to the commission mm. and also to let us know uh, what they're getting, sending us copies of text messages or, or writing to us and complain. So if people want to complain, like, how do they reach the Digital Protection Commission. So the there, data, sorry. there are various data. channels for complaining. You hmm. can write to us or you can, and, and our, we are online. You can go online and use the info at dataprotection.org.gh uh, hmm. or you can ring the commission and complain. Okay, and what's the turnaround time? So I'm getting these messages and I really want them to stop. I've sent stop and they're still coming. And so then we have I some write. class actions. Hmm. Uh, that it's, it's groups of people coming together, together to and complaining about the same thing Great. that we are handling at the moment uh, to do with unsolicited calls and emails. So we are dealing with some of them. Hmm. Now you tend to find it the same or similar companies doing that across the nation. So when it comes to our notice, we do deal with them. We do stay on top of them. We have so many questions. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time. We're almost out of time. Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking, like a part two? Yeah, well, we have to do because we're, we're yet to even come to Ghana, <laughs> where <laughs> data breach and data leaks are like rife with us. Like what, she, what, what the gentleman who called was complaining about. It's, it's something a lot of people were complaining about, that um, some companies have been selling data to some other companies so they can do all these kinds of advertising. Um, someone's also asking, what plan is in place to enforce these really beautiful regulations? I think she's answered that. And what is ISAC Accra Isaka. Chapter doing to Isaka Ch Accra Chapter doing to sensitive corporations on GDPR and the DPA? So I can answer that one. You can answer that. Actually, I'm, a, I'm quite uh, active with Isaka guys. Uh, okay. Well, Carl Saki is ever so humble. He failed to mention that he's the president of Isaka. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Isaka is actually they are training a lot of professionals in the industry uh, to tell them what the best practices are. 
I mean, they're not the enforcers as such. Uh, this would fall under the uh, Data Protection Commission itself. I mean, there are a few movements happening in Ghana already. So ISACO has been one of them. They have all these getting together meetings, chapter meetings, and events, all that kind of stuff, which is talk about information security and try to be uh, using real terms and what's happening in Ghana. Uh, there's another thing called OWASP, which is like an open web application security project. Again, it's a global thing. Again, also happening here in Ghana as well. They have chapter meetings. So, I mean, uh, we talked about individuals early on. They're saying that, okay, you have to go protect your uh, information mm. by clicking on privacy tab and don't track me and don't put your phone numbers all over the place, all that kind of stuff. But also, if there are professionals out there, people who are developers, the software engineers, all that guys yeah. that are actually creating these things, these are good places to be involved with, to learn the best practices. And it, most of these uh, resources are free of charge as well, to actually go and you know follow the practices and to protect the individuals as well. Okay, so we ran out of time, right on point. Yeah. So this has been Geek Squad. With me was Divine Cha. Yeah. He's a cybersecurity specialist. And Ms. P Patricia Poku, Executive Director of the Data Protection Commission. Winston Woodshe. I'm Rick Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and Ash Dasmalchi. I'm sure we'll speak again. We'll definitely speak again. We'll try and bring this next week okay. again. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.